Welcome to the Road to 5G, brought to you by the Rogers Corporation. Today's topic, Key Material Properties for 5G, Part 2. Factors Affecting Pin Performance in Sub-6 GHz 5G Antennas. Hello, my name is John Coonrod with Rogers Corporation. I am a Technical Marketing Manager, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Road to 5G and Key Material Properties for 5G with an emphasis on PIM. PIM is an abbreviation for a passive intermodulation and it can be a concern in some 5G applications. This video is really going to be broken out into two different segments. The first segment will be uh, basically a history of Rogers in regards to PIM testing and then also I'll show our test methods, test procedures, and then some data that's generated from that. The second portion of the video is really going to be more with an emphasis on the material properties themselves and some of the variables that printed circuit board uh, fabrication has in regards to PIM performance. So to begin with, uh, Rogers has been doing PIM testing for a number of years, about 16 years actually. So we started doing PIM testing in the year 20, uh, 2001 really. And at the time we bought a piece of equipment from Sumatech and with the help of Sumatech, we defined a test method that was using a transmission line. And we've been using that since. Over time, we've actually worked very closely with a lot of antenna OEMs, antenna designers, to understand the test method a little better. And we have made refinements over time. Uh, and I'll describe the, the test method a little bit. Uh, we are also involved with the IEC um, consortium. And what they're doing is they are generating test methods and procedures for PIM. However, it's not specific to how you would test a material or even a printed circuit board. They're more looking at systems. Uh, however, we are, as I said, working with the IEC to try to understand uh, and hopefully generate a uh, test method for PIM. So right now there is no industry standard test method for PIM, PIM testing of circuit materials or PIM testing of a printed circuit board. As shown in the picture, this is portions of our test method, and uh, the test vehicle itself is actually a long, 12-inch long, 50-ohm microstrip transmission line. And then uh, we have defined this test method around a 60 mil thick sample many years ago. However, over time we have uh, changed that and we are able to test uh, circuits of different thicknesses. And we test a good amount of 30 mil thick circuits now, so anywhere from 30 to 60 mil, we test uh, circuits in that thickness range. The, uh, the cables that are used, they're flexible, low-PIM coaxial cables. They're soldered directly onto the microstrip uh, circuit. The other end of the cable will have a low-PIM connector that will be connected to a low-PIM load, and the other cable will go to the PIM uh, tester itself. And then also, as you can see in the picture, there are some red frames there, and these red frames are really put on after soldering the coaxial connector, coaxial cable to the circuit itself, and those red brackets are there to really minimize any kind of mechanical stress that could happen during movement of the test vehicle. At Rogers, we have three different pieces of equipment that does PIM testing. All three pieces of equipment have the same capabilities, and essentially what they're doing, they're testing uh, using a two-tone source that is centered around 1900 megahertz. The power level is about 43 dBm, and uh, we're looking at uh, the reflected PIM of the IM3, which is the third intermodulation. As part of our test procedure, what we will do after we have everything connected and turn on the PIM tester, we will purposely manipulate the test vehicle and move the cables around to get the optimum position for the best PIM reading. We will also do the same with the connectors, where we sometimes may disconnect and reconnect the connectors torque and retorque. We also may desolder and resolder again. And really what we're doing is we're trying to minimize the variables as much as we can that are not what we're trying to test. So we're trying to test the test vehicle itself for PIM and we're trying to eliminate the other variables. So we know that connectors and the connection between the connectors can actually cause an issue with PIM. We know the position of the cables can cause an issue with PIM. So we're really trying to min minimize these variables as much as we can by hooking up the entire test vehicle and then move things around until we get the optimum PIM in an effort to only test the test vehicle for the PIM performance. The graph shown here is data that was collected on a microstrip transmission line or a normal test vehicle. The material in this case was 60.7 mil RO4730 G3 material. And you can see that what we do is test over a period of time and we're looking for the third IM, third intermodulation. Uh, and that's roughly 1870 megahertz. But over 55 seconds, we record data, 10 data points per second, so about 550 data points here. 
And in a conservative uh, move, really what we're doing is getting rid of the best five PIM values. Again, it's conservative. Uh, may not really be uh, valid, but we do it anyway just as a conservative move to make sure that the PIM values are uh, a, a good average anyway. And then we do average the rest of the data, and then we report the final PIM as the average number. In this case, uh, the average PIM that we would report for this particular circuit would be about minus 164 dBc, which is actually very good. Over many years of testing circuits in PIM, we've come to the conclusion that PIM is not a materials property. PIM is actually a circuit property, and it can also be a circuit assembly property or a system property, but it is not a materials property. However, we do know that some material properties do influence PIM, and because of that, we've done many evaluations. What I'd like to do is show you a quick chart of an uh, example of why it's obvious that uh, PIM is not a circuit, or uh, I'm sorry, PIM is not a material issue, it is actually a circuit issue. The chart shown here is a comparison of three circuits that are all made on the same material. And when I mean the same material, I mean the exact same sheet of material. And these circuits are within inches of each other, right on the same sheet of material. The only difference are the design. So in one case, we have a bandpass filter. Another is a low-pass filter. And the last one is a transmission line. The transmission line is actually our normal test vehicle. But you can see with circuits made on the exact same sheet of material within inches of each other, they perform radically different for PIM. So the bandpass filter, this is an edge-coupled bandpass filter. It has a PIM performance on the average about minus 128 dBc, which is not considered good. And then the low-pass filter, stepped impedance low-pass filter is what this is, that has an average PIM performance about minus 148 dBc, also in the questionable range. And then the transmission line circuit, you can see that that's hitting about minus 167 dBc, and that's actually a really good number for this uh, material. This is 32.7 mil RO4535 materials, and basically as the materials are thinner, like a 32 mil material, you usually have a little bit worse pin performance than a thicker material. But in this case, you can see uh, the transmission line performed very well. But again, uh, the difference of these uh, different pin values are based on circuit design only and not material. This is using the exact same sheet of material, and these circuits were, th were within inches of each other. One important topic for material properties that we know does impact PIM performance is copper surface roughness. Copper surface roughness, and specifically that is the copper surface roughness at the interface of the substrate and copper as we make the laminate, that surface roughness most certainly can affect PIM performance. The dielectric material itself can as well. However, our materials that are formulated for good intended performance, we have no issue with that. It's really the copper surface roughness that is the concern. In the picture shown here, this is output of one of our uh, laser profilometers, and actually a more accurate way of saying this type of uh, test, it's actually using a non-contact white light interferometer. And it's measuring the copper surface roughness of the copper foil, and we do this when we measure the raw copper foil before we make the laminate. So we have a very good picture and good values of the copper surface roughness before the laminate is made. The chart shown here is a summary of a study that we did where we used the same substrate but different copper type. And specifically, we were looking at different copper type that had different copper surface roughness. And we measured the copper surface roughness with our laser profilometer before we made the laminate. And here in the chart, you can see that the circuits that were made with the laminate with the rougher copper had the worst pin performance. So the very rough copper, the high profile copper, uh, that has uh, surface roughness about three microns or more, uh, this is as RMS, root mean square. You can see the pin performance is about minus 130 to minus 140 dBc, which is really not that good. And then as you move to the left of the chart, you will find that you get much better pin performance when you use the copper that has a much smoother profile. And down around 0.5 microns RMS surface roughness, you can see the pin performance is doing quite well, uh, anywhere from minus 150. And in some cases, we got as high as minus 167 when we got down in the range of the rolled annealed copper of about 0.3 to 0.4 microns RMS. There are also other issues that can impact uh, PIM performance, and some of these are related to printed circuit board manufacturing. Uh, one particular issue can be the cleanliness of the circuit. So the circuit may appear to be pretty clean, but there can be residues left behind. And we have found uh, in some of our studies that the cleanliness or the residues left behind for uh, circuit fabrication can impact PIM in a negative way. And then there's different types of plated finishes that are used for, uh, for circuit manufacturing. And some of these plated finishes can have a negative impact on PIM, and actually some can have a positive impact on PIM. 
And then, of course, solder mask is also used as well. And we found in some of our studies, the solder mask may actually improve the PIM just a little bit. So I'd like to give you a little bit of data shown in this table. The information in the table here is showing a comparison we did with two different materials. And one material, we had two different lots, lot A and lot B. The comparison is using our standard test vehicle, which is labeled as bare copper. And you can see the PIM performance for that is not as good as the other uh, properties, which is labeled SM and immersion 10. And that's really solder mask over bare copper with immersion tin in the areas where the cable was soldered to the circuit. And you can see in that case, with the solder mask and immersion tin, in every case, the PEM was improved over our bare copper test vehicle. So we've heard this before in the industry, and we've actually seen it now in this study and other studies. The solder mask does actually improve the PEM performance. And in other studies, we've seen that immersion tin by itself can improve PEM performance as compared to bare copper. As most of us know that deal with PIM issues, ferromagnetic materials are problematic for PIM. And that's true as we think about the plated finishes that are used in printed circuit boards. Some of the printed circuit board plated finishes do have ferromagnetic properties, and that can cause a problem with PIM. However, other plated finishes, as we saw in the last uh, bit of information, actually can improve PIM. So I want to show you a little more information on another study we did that's comparing some of these plated finishes and the results on PIM performance. This uh, graph is showing a comparison of the same circuits, only with different finish. And in this case, the circuits were built on 32.7 mm RO4534 laminate. And uh, they were all built at the same time. They're all microstrip transmission line circuits. The difference is the finishes. The blue curve, which is ENIG, Electrus Nickel Immersion Gold, that is the worst one. It's got a PIM performance about minus 138 dBC, which is considered very bad. And of course, nickel is ferromagnetic, and that's why the circuit responded the way it did. Now, the other finishes, the red curve and the blue curve, that's actually immersion 10. And you can see that they're in a range of PEM that's extremely good PEM performance, down around minus 163, minus 165 dBC. And then the green curve solder mask, that's right around the same range, maybe just a little bit uh, different. But at that level of PIM, it's really difficult to distinguish one from another. So in this case, I'd say the solder mask and the immersion tin that was thick and the immersion tin that was thin all pretty much behave the same. They're right around minus 163 to minus 165, which is very good PIM performance. Now, what I should have done was put on there um, a chart showing the reference, which is bare copper. And if I had done that in this particular case, it would have been a line at minus 157 dBC as a reference. This concludes this segment of The Road to 5G. Thank you for watching. For additional information and technical tools, if you're not already a member, join the Rogers Technical Support Hub and gain access to calculators, technical papers, and more Rogers Corporation informational videos. Rogers Technical Information is also available at your fingertips with the Raj mobile app, available for the iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. Check it out today.